Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your instructions in life and blessing. And we just pray that you will guide us as we re-roll the Torah scroll today and start from the very beginning, that you will open our eyes and our hearts to the wonderful things in your Torah. And that you will speak to us truth in a world that is full of lies. And that we will be able to see your truth, your light, in spite of what the world is trying to say. Because truth always triumphs over darkness. So Father, be with us today as we start this series, the Genesis series. In Yeshua's name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Okay. If I was going to start a Genesis series, where would be a good place to start it? Probably in the beginning, right? Okay. Um, and this is the whole thing, really. This is the whole thing right here. Um, in the beginning, God. So when you look at this, it's one of two things in your life. It's either a problem or it's a solution. But it doesn't change. So it depends on how you look at it. It depends on where you are. But the situation, the word, the truth there doesn't change. Um, God is just who he is, okay? It's us who has to decide if we're going to stand with that truth or in opposition to that truth. And so we're going to look at some stuff today. Um, just give you some concepts here. In the beginning... God didn't just exist, you know, which is what this one is. I love the way it's just, in the beginning, God. I mean, if we just get that, I mean, it, it's almost like the Ten Commandments when it's like, uh, I'm Yahweh. It's like, do we really need to keep going? <laughs> it's like, in the beginning, God. Do we, okay, the Genesis series, that's it. See y'all, all right. The blue box is in the back, put your offerings in there. I mean, if we could just get that, really, Okay. But it's more than that. In the beginning, God created. And that's really where the struggle comes in. Because people try to figure out, what does that mean? What exactly does that mean? That sort of thing. If you look at the Hebrew uh, here, um, Bereshit came, comes from the word, it has a prefix there on it, the ba, uh, ba on Rashit. And really, what we have is, it's in the beginning. And the word there really in this context means absolutely in the absolute beginning, okay? It was in the absolute beginning that God created. And in modern times, the enemy, Hasatan, along with a bunch of Russian bots designed to create disharmony, and some 30-year-olds sitting in their parents' basement in their boxer shorts on the internet, have been busy, really, really busy, mixing truth with error, okay? And, and some of it we've fallen for. And so I hope to clarify some of that today. The question is, can we see how this was understood in ancient times? Because we know we live in a time of disinformation. Absolutely with it. Does anybody in here think we're getting truth from anywhere? Schools, internet, anywhere. You're not. You're getting a mixture. It's always a mixture. And so you have to sort through that. There's been times when you got a lot of truth. There's been times when you got complete error. Okay. But right now we're just in this murky, murky, murky stuff. And you know, the Bible tells us don't mix, don't mix, don't mix. And we're in a time of just total mixing of truth and error. So let's take a look and see what uh, we can find out here. Interesting, this, again, this word means beginning. And around 250 BC, there were 72 Hebrew scholars and elders who were sent to Alexandria, Egypt, to translate the Hebrew Bible into Greek. Okay? And according to tradition, um, they had asked for learned scholars, elders who had exemplary lives. You know, And when they came, and they came to this word in the beginning, and they're going to translate it into Greek. Of course, they speak Greek, because the Greek culture from Alexander the Great, or at least he thought he was Greek, um, but that's another story. What word did they use? They used this word, enarche. Enarche is a enarche is a word which literally would translate into the very beginning, the very beginning, the absolute beginning. So they chose a word in Greek that is far even more specific than reshit or bereshit in Hebrew. Enarche in the very beginning. 
And so we have a beginning. The ancient scholars agreed that this was what it meant in Hebrew. This is what it meant. And uh, we're looking back, you know, over 2,000 years. This is what it meant at that time, the time of Yeshua. This was his understanding of what it meant. He talks about it a lot. And so when things have a beginning, what does that mean? Does something just happen? No. When something has a beginning, it has a sufficient cause. Okay? And this is really, 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 really important. I'm going to make really three important points here on, the, on this slide to help you understand the controversy of creation. Okay? Now, we know, we know, we know this. We just don't know we know this. But if we walked out to the road and it was quiet and we we're just standing there talking and a bowling ball came rolling by and we're, we're just standing here talking and we're looking at a, something over there on the ground and a bowling ball came by, what are we going to do? We're going to look that way. We're not going to look at the ball. We're going to go, whoa, and we're going to look that way. We see a thing that's happening. We know it had a beginning, and we look to see what the cause was. Okay? So we have to know that. That's one of the things. And so if there's a beginning, there's a sufficient cause. And so this will help us understand that. The Bible is a history book. Okay, we have to look at it as a history book. It tells us what happened and why spiritually it happened. It is not a science book. It is a history book. It tells us what happened. It's really important. Science attempts to tell us why. The Bible tells us what. The, Bible, the science tells us why something in the physical happens. Science does not reach into the realm of the spiritual. Okay, can't operate there. So science that looks, looks at what has happened and attempts to tell why, or what is happening ideally, okay? Why are the planets orbiting? What do we have to do to get a, um, a spaceship to a certain place, you know? So it's telling us what it is that's going on. Dr. Stephen Hawking, I'm sure you've heard of him, had, wrote a paper, it was a lecture actually, and it was called The Beginning of Time. It's in 1996. I think it was very uh, appropriate for today. And this is a very abbreviated version. It's quite long. And this is where he started out. This is where he starts out. He says, in this lecture, I would like to discuss whether time itself has a beginning and whether it will have an end. All the evidence seems to indicate that the universe has not existed forever, but that it had a beginning. That's really important from an atheist. Okay. He goes on, he said, since events before the Big Bang, Big Bang have no observational consequences, one may as well just forget about them. We might as well just cut them out of the theory. And I'm like, hold up a minute, Dr. Hawkins. <laughs> Whatever happened before the Big Bang has no observational consequences? I beg to differ. Okay? The laws of logic dictate that a cause, the Big Bang, has a, you know, an event, the Big Bang, has a sufficient cause. And so if the Big Bang of creation existed, then there was a sufficient cause before that event. I'm really, really interested in what that sufficient cause was, okay? And, the, and it would make sense that that sufficient cause had a reason to cause it, and that therefore it would transcend the time and be existing beyond the Big Bang, right? I mean, it just makes sense. So in my world, it is extremely re relevant, the consequence. So there, there's no consequence. There, there are consequences. It, and I'm going to suggest that it is observable, and it's observable to those who choose not to ignore the creator of creation. Okay? So it says, may well, may well just cut, you know, whatever happened before that. We might as well just cut this out of the theory and say that time itself began at the Big Bang. All right? So that's okay. That makes sense. Time itself did begin at the Big Bang. And we'll talk about that some more. But to look at the Big Bang 
okay? The creation, that's just the word they call it when everything came into existence. To look at the Big Bang and ignore the cause is to look at the Eiffel Tower and ignore the designer, Gustav Eiffel, whose company, you know, built it and designed it. We might as well say, well, you know, it's just natural design and, you know, it's a cool tower. Um, you know, you wouldn't do that. Hawkins goes on to say that the natural design is actually part of the create. You know, the creation was just natural. We're going to look at some more of that, what he said in a second. You would not look at that tower and ignore the designer. You look at that tower and actually admire the designer. Okay? You admire. That's why it's still there. Because it's cool. It actually doesn't do virtually anything. I mean, it's mostly just there. Okay? Okay. It does draw tourists. <laughs> That's worth something, I'm sure. And by the way, the lights on it now are copyrighted. You can't take a picture of it at night because it's art. Okay. But, um, so, but you really wouldn't ignore it. And so if you would, wouldn't ignore something that man made, why would you ignore something far more complex that it had a designer? So we have to look at this. We have to look at the designer, the builder. So before we do that, I want to pause and just consider a couple of things. I want to consider the following. Everything that has a beginning has a sufficient cause, right? Stephen Hawkins says the universe had a beginning. The Bible says the universe had a beginning. Both agree it has a cause. The Bible says it's the power and the design of Yahweh Elohim that created the universe. Dr. Hawkins says it's the intrinsic laws of the universe that designed the universe. So that brings up a question for Dr. Hawkins. Why does the universe have laws? He said they're intrinsic to the universe, natural born into the universe. Okay, that may be true, but the question is why are they there? Dr. Hawkins recognized the design of the universe and that had laws of physics from its inceptions, but to say that, there's, that there was some great explosion of creation and all of a sudden it's order and physical laws, what's the normal outcome of an explosion? Chaos. Okay, so, and to go on, they, when you ask what exploded, they say, well, virtually nothing because there was nothing there. So nothing created, I'm sorry, nothing exploded and created everything with natural laws built into it. And the entire universe has natural laws intrinsic. Come on. I mean, that's not working for me. That's not just not working. Okay. He continues. He says, there's no dynamical reason why the motion of bodies in the solar system cannot be extrapolated back in time far beyond 4004 BC, the date for the creation of the universe according to the book of Genesis. Okay, so he's saying, we, why can't we just go right on back? Because if we stop at 4004 BC, we have to deal with the creator who's standing there at 4040 BC. And we really don't want to deal with him, so let's just keep going. And see if we can ignore him and just get back here somewhere where it just gets so murky, we don't really know what happened. Okay. He said, because if we didn't, it would require this direct intervention of God if the universe began at that date, and which he really doesn't want, and he's trying to exclude God. And as soon as you automatically think about this, as soon as you automatically, as a scientist, exclude any possible answer you don't like based on your personal bias, you have stopped doing observational science. It's no longer science, which requires that no possible truth be excluded. Okay? So as soon as you do this on purpose, you've destroyed the experiment. You've destroyed the science. He keeps going. He says, by contrast... The Big Bang is a beginning that required by the natural dynamic, I'm sorry, by the dynamical laws that govern the universe. You know, we're back to that again. Dynamical laws that govern the universe? Universal laws from the beginning, and he's going to exclude from the equation the possibility of a designer who was there from the beginning? Okay? That doesn't really work, does it? Think about it. 
You know, if you stop there, he says there's, <laughs> I like what he said, there is therefore, it is therefore intrinsic to the universe and not opposed on it from the outside. How do you know that? How can he possibly make that statement as a scientist? Seriously. Think about it. It's just logic. Okay? So he's going to exclude that possibility. So when you do that, you're no longer doing science, but you're manipulating the outcome to what you want. You've excluded this huge realm of possibility, which there's a tremendous amount of evidence for, and you're just choosing to ignore that. So basically he's saying that it came from, you know, it came, these intrinsic laws came from nowhere and now rule the universe? Come on. That's not science. That's not logic. That doesn't fit. The operational, what we call the scientific method, that science itself, that modern science is based on, is based on, was based on, by belief in God. What they understood was that if there's a creator, then there's a pattern, and things should be testable, and we should see that pattern. Okay? And so you can just test the things that God created, and, it, and it, if he created everything, it should be testable here. It would work halfway around the world. The whole scientific method is based on that. And here's how it works. It says we make an observation. Scientists are naturally curious about the world, so they see something. Hmm, that's interesting. Wonder how that works. There's the observation. And you form a question. Okay? Like, why does it work? How does it work? And so you want to you wanna check that out. So you form a hypothesis about how it works. I think it works. I think a bird can fly because they flap really fast. Okay? But we better take a look. You know, we better look at their wings. And so then you just take something and make it flap really fast and see if it flies. And then you might discover that it actually has to do with the aerodynamic shape of their wings. And you do that by conducting an experiment, Right? So you conduct an experiment, and then you analyze the data from the experiment, and you draw a conclusion. That's the scientific method, operational scientific method. Makes sense? Works. Okay, it really does work. So operational science is how we test medicine to see if it works. It's how they come up with the whole idea of, of what medicines might work. It's how you test, test nuclear physics how you test cancer treatments, you might be making fertilizer, you might be testing rocket science, you might be looking at photosynthesis. All of this is observational science. But there's another field of science, a pseudoscience, that reports to be, purports to be in the same realm when in fact it's not. And it's called historical science or origin science. Their method is slightly different. It works like this. You make an observation in the present Okay, we're here, there's an observation. And you form a hypothesis. We must have created ourselves. Okay? The problem is, when you're looking at historical and origin science, it's not testable. It's not observable. It's not repeatable. All those things are required in, op you know, in operational science. So all of a sudden, it's like, okay, we have a problem. And so you draw a conclusion which excludes God at all cost. All observable information that refutes that conclusion is excluded. And you call it science. When in reality, it is a belief system. It is a religion. It is not based on facts. It is not based on anything that's testable. So historical science is not the same thing as observational science. The, the, the entire thing really is based on a hypothesis. It's just an idea. It's just a philosophy. And then when it's not, you just draw that conclusion. Ultimately, you say the conclusion is the fact. Okay? Religious bias in historical science really has turned to time as their God. Right? In the field of historical and origin science, not operational science, where we can see what's going on. And so this is very interesting. Uh, atheist uh, Richard Dawkins, who wrote The God Delusion and all these crazy things, you've seen him. This appeared in The Guardian in the UK. Um, he says this. Given sufficient time, 
The non-random survival of hereditary entities will generate complexity, diversity, beauty, and an illusion of design so persuasive that it is almost impossible to distinguish it from deliberate intelligent design. How convenient. <laughs> Yet, he's convinced that he is the man who's going to distinguish that difference for you, since you can't, okay? And he's going he's gonna to explain it. He's going to tell the world that in spite of all the facts of what you see, that is an obvious evidence of a designer with tremendous intelligence. He has even more intelligence. And he has put it here, you know, he, he is going to put forth that all of this is here because of some primordial slime pit. And tell the rest of us slimesters to just ignore the obvious and believe him instead. I don't buy it. Okay. This is not science. It's, it's, you know, this would never, this would just never held up in years ago. I mean, I would love to see these guys stand up and with the philosophers in, in Greek, you know, in Greece and Athens around the, you know, the time of Yeshua and see what would happen. It wouldn't fly. Okay. Keep going. So here's a question. I've actually worked with a, a lot of atheist scientists and believing scientists. And I'll tell you, it's a whole lot more fun to work with the believers than the atheists because the atheists are like double-minded. What does an atheist scientist or archaeologist do when they find an arrowhead? They look at it and they just, oh, this has intelligent design. It must have had a designer. Let's study these people. Let's see how old this thing is, right? They look at it, it's intelligent design. It had to have a designer, right? And try to figure out who made it. What do they do when they find a primitive cave drawing? It could just be something like, is that really? Or is that just like an animal rubbing his horn on the wall and that's not really? What is that? No, no, no. This is a cave drawing. Some ancient man did this. We've got to figure out who did this. So something that looks like it might have a little intelligence to it, even just a little bit. Yep, this is, this is a sign of intelligence. There must have been a man here, right? That's what they, you've seen all this stuff on TV. How about when they find a piece of clay and it's like, you know what, I, I think this is actually might have been part of a pot. Oh yeah, this is intelligent design. There, there, has to be, there has to be a designer behind it, right? Everything they find in the ground, they do this over and over and over. What do they do when they find the exquisite design of a human eye with 137 million light-sensitive cells, 40 subsystems operating at the same time and in perfect harmony, including the retina, the pupil, the iris, the cornea, the lens, the optic nerve, and the brain structures, which sees color, contrast, depth, and allows us to actually see pictures in our mind? No, uh, actually time did that. Think about it. Is that double-mindedness? This is exactly what we're talking about. This is exactly what's being taught in the schools today. This is exactly what's being taught in the universities today. By the way, if you're in the university, do not believe for a second that all the professors believe this. It's just not cool to say anything. You'll lose your tenure. You won't get published. And the whole rule, if you're a professor, especially if you're a high-level professor, it's publish or perish. Okay? They make their money by publishing papers. If you're not publishing, you're short-lived there. Okay, that's where they get their money. And so they're in a game that they play, and everybody's, because of political correctness, they're all, I mean, I know some scientists at, at several universities that are strong, strong believers, but they don't dare go there in their papers. You just don't go there, okay? They don't say they don't believe it. But there's a problem. God created time. So they didn't get away from what they were trying to do. So Hawkins agrees that you know, at, the, at the creation, time was created there. And if we go back, what did Genesis 1 say? In the beginning, God, right? Richard Dawkins was asked this question, like, because the eye is one of the most complex structures, and you can't have part of an eye. You know, just part of an eye doesn't work, okay? So he said, how, how, Dr. Hawkins, how, how could an eye have possibly formed? And this was his answer. He said, well, audiences appreciate an answer, and I have usually fallen back on the sheer magnitude of geological time. Okay. Unobservable, untestable, not repeatable, 
the hypothesis becomes the fact in this science of fantasy. It is in reality a science of fantasy. This is not observational science. This is fantasy world. This is political correct fantasy world. The Bible actually is not a scientific textbook which is really, really good. Because scientific textbooks have to be rewritten every few years. And that's serious. I guarantee you that the science textbooks in any university are less than five years old. Most of them are two to three year old at, or less since our last major correction. And yet we're supposed to put our faith in today's science books. Not, not yesterday's, not last week's, not the one for next year, two years. I mean, I, I know. Do you know what these books cost? You know why they cost so much? It's not. Okay, I mean, they're hundreds of dollars. They wear you out trying to buy your science book. Okay. And then when you go, sometime you go to trade it back in, it's like, ah, we really don't want that. We got a new one this year. It's like, dude, I just bought it. It's only two, it's, you know, it's copyrighted two years ago. Yeah, I know, but we got a good, we got a new one. Did you ever notice that the Bible doesn't have to be rewritten? The people tried to rewrite it, but that's another story. But it really doesn't have to be rewritten. People try to make it where it's easier for different people to read it and that sort of thing. It doesn't have to be rewritten for a reason because historical truth does not change. Truth is truth. History is history. Okay. So are we supposed to put our faith in today's science books, again, which are largely written by men who reject the reality of recorded history and observational science in favor of political correct, the political correct atheistic idea that the universe created itself. That essentially nothing exploded and created everything. But like I say, in reality, a lot of the great scientists today are believers. They just can't talk about it. Yeah, because of... So what is the truth? In the beginning, God created. And that's what we have evidence for. That's what the evidence supports. I'm going to stand here right now and admit I was a... I was, I, my background's in science, in earth science, geology. I was hardcore science guy from when I was, gosh, fifth grade, sixth grade. I had labs in my house, more than one. Okay, I had an electronics lab. I had a mechanical lab. I had a chemistry lab. Drove my mom up the wall. Okay, there's stuff all over the house. Okay, there's, there's always stuff going on in the house. Like, don't bring fire in my house. You're like, okay, I'll do that on the porch. You know, but so, and I grew up in... Um, you know, watching, you know, getting models of all the new rockets that they were built. I live in Florida, so it makes it really easy. And building the rocket models of all the moon launches and everything. Um, but got into um, college age and earth science, geology. I was kind of an environmentalist at the time. We actually started a little nonprofit environmental thing. And um, was buying into what my professors were saying until I started looking at the evidence. I, I looked at the Bible and I was like, you know, he can do it any way he wants. I don't care, whatever he did. It wasn't I didn't believe in God. It was just like, oh, that's that, and this is how he did it, the, what they're telling me. And when I started looking at the physical evidence, I'm going, we got a problem here. The physical evidence supports the Bible, not historical the way the science has been, not evolution. I mean, when I'm looking at supposedly millions of years of strata and there's a petrified pine tree growing through it, upside down, literally, I'm like, you know, something different happened here. This is just not, something's wrong. You ever notice when they find dinosaur bones, they're all in a big pile and they're all in a wad and tangled up? That's the way you find them, right? You've seen the pictures. They're, they're like in conglomerate. And big chunks of the dinosaurs missing. Almost like it was a whirlpool or something where they're all collected and rotting and they're missing pieces. How do you get a Tyrannosaurus Rex who's missing his head? You know, or missing a leg or something. Picture rotting flesh in a worldwide flood. The evidence supports the biblical narrative. The evidence supports what the Bible says happened. Okay? It didn't shake my belief in God either way. It's just the sheer evidence Scientific method supports scripture, not evolution. Okay. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
all the matter and the energy. Think about this. There's, there's no argument here. Stephen Hawking's theory about this and the Bible's explanation of this are the same. The Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth and that means that all the matter and energy in the universe came into existence all at once. You know how much power we're talking about there? I got a question for you. You ready? You never thought about that, did you? What do you think that sound sounded like? All the energy, power, matter. There's a, there's a lot of matter in the universe. Okay. I don't think that was a, sounded like a tweet. Okay. That wasn't. No. Big Bang, you think? Oh my goodness. Duh. Of course there's background heat and everything in, in the cosmos from this event. Of course there is. And we know the universe is winding down. And that's why Hawkins finally gave in that, that his theory has actually changed over time. And that's why he finally gave in that the universe is in fact entropy winding down. Because it's expanding. We can measure it. You know, we see the background heat of the universe. Of, and that's the background heat of creation itself. So all space, time, and matter and the laws of physics came into existence at one single event. And guess what? It had not only a cause, it had a sufficient cause. Think about that. In the beginning, God. There's your sufficient cause. There is no other explanation for this. Nothing doesn't create everything. Nothing doesn't explode. We're talking about we're talking about amount of power that you can't, we can't even begin to imagine. It. Oh my goodness. Let's go back to Hawking for a minute. This is the conclusion of the lecture. He says, the conclusion of this lecture is that the universe has not existed forever. Rather, the universe and time itself had a beginning in the Big Bang. And that was the beginning of real time. As if there's an unreal time. And he says that because we know, we know because of the theory of relativity and other things that time really didn't exist before creation. Okay. And he goes on, he says, nevertheless, the way the universe began would have been determined by the laws of physics. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. So, again, we have the Eiffel Tower, which is like, something that just happened when a steel factory down the street exploded and blew all the parts into one place and they'll just assemble them and what appears to be an intelligent design but in reality it's just a random event which by my current observations I would say will never happen again and it never happened before which is contrary to my previous observation which I thought was happening over and over again but this way as long as I exclude God I'm happy and that's all that really matters and that's my theory Okay, so I'm poking fun at Hawk, Dr. Hawkins a little bit. That's okay, I'm picking on him. But come on, man. He goes on and he says, so we'll keep getting older. We won't return to our use because time is not going to go bad, backwards. And then he says, I think I better stop now. I agree. You, you, just, you just need, just stop it. Just stop it, okay? Because this is not working. I mean, this is not working. And then this question comes up. Okay, fair enough. God created it. If God created the universe, what is the cause of God? Okay, there's laws of logic philosophy. And so really, what we're doing, let's look at this. One of the laws of logic philosophy is that everything that has a beginning has a sufficient cause, right? We've looked at that several times. So to ask what happened before time is actually irrational because there is no time before time. Time actually had a beginning. God created time. He is not part of creation. He is the, crea he is the creator. Okay? And he doesn't have a beginning because he exists outside of time and before time. He amazingly has the ability to step into time. Think about this one. If you just, as long as we're doing time... Time is all relative, right? So if the creator of time, who's outside of time, who existed before time, created time as he created the universe, okay, we good so far? He's outside of time, he created the universe, stepped into his creation, he's eternal, ever-present, and outside of time. Does he cease to exist outside of time when he steps inside of time? No, he doesn't. Okay. 
That's really important. So that would allow him to come in a physical form into his creation. Think, just put that one on pause. In the beginning God is actually evidence that God already existed before the beginning. Because in the beginning he created. So he existed before creation. Okay, that's, so that's what we're talking about. Right? He existed before the beginning, before time. This is interesting when you look at his name. So just look, let's just look at him for a minute. Just look at God. Who is he? Moses says to God, Behold, when I come to the sons of Israel, you know, he met God, there's trees on fire that's not burning up, and you told him to take his shoes off and all that. He says, uh, When I say the God of your father sent me, what am I going to say? They're going to say, What's his name? They've been slaves in Egypt. They've forgot who they are, right? Forgotten who they are. What shall I say? And God said to Moshe, I am that I am. You should tell the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. This is actually very interesting. His name is very interesting because this is a statement of being. He just is, okay? He's asking, who are you? I, I just am, okay? Before time, during time, after time, outside of time, inside of time, creator of time, I just am, okay? I know that was all English. Christine Hayes, the professor of religious studies at Yale, makes this comment. Moses says, may I say who sent me? She's very polite. May I say who sent me? <laughs> and he asks for his name, and the Israelites want to know, okay? Ayah, asher, ayah. This is a first-person sentence that can be translated, I am who I am, or maybe I will be who I will be, or perhaps I cause to be what I cause to be, or perhaps in a more Hebraic realm, all of that yeah. at the same time. Yeah. She's thinking Greek, exclusive. Hebrew is inclusive. He's all of that at once. Yeah. That's why the phrase, ayah, asher, ayah. Okay, so he's all of that at one time. I am who I am. I will cause what I will cause. And that sentence actually gets shortened to Yahweh. This is the Bible's explanation for the name Yahweh. And as the personal name of God, some have argued that the name Yahweh actually expresses the quality of being. That he, he is. He's being. It's an active, dynamic being. He just is, okay? But not yet that active, dynamic being. Which brings up the question, why? Why? Why is there even creation? You got this eternal ever present outside of time, God. Why creation? I mean, that. see, science does it. I mean, if all of this is about big bangs and all this stuff, the question is why? 1 John 4, 8 says God is love. It's who he is. It's his character. The expression of love, if that's who he is, according to scripture, if that's who he is, the expression of love requires relationship, doesn't it? So the creator desires relationship with his creation. So that's a reason for creation. Let's look what the word says. He says to Abraham, I'm sorry, the Moses. Mo Moshe. I'm the God of your father, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. So he's like, this is who I am. I had a relationship with your fathers, okay? I'm Yahovah. I have seen the affliction of, of who? My people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cries of their taskmaster. I know their sorrows. That's relationship, isn't it? It's like I hear what they're saying. I know they're in pain. I know, I know what's going on. And so I'm coming down. I'm going to be their deliverer. I'm going to take them out of this situation. That's relationship. I don't want them in this situation. I hear them. I care about them. It's relationship. I love them. Okay? He is love. Probably the most famous verse in the Bible. God loved the world. He gave his only, in, and, that, and we understand that, what that means. You know, God is one. He came in a physical being. What would you call that? I mean, he gave himself and a physical being that whoever believes in him whoever believes in Yeshua would not perish but have everlasting life what is that? that's love Jeremiah 31 I want a covenant with you I want a covenant with my people this is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after those days says Yahweh I'll put my instructions inside them I'll write it on their hearts 
I'll be, my, I'll be their God. They'll be my people. That's relationship, isn't it? He's about relationship. Creation is about relationship. So he could have relationship. I'm Yahweh, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. That's really the first commandment. He breaked thought. Not Western thought. We like commands. Go do this, go do that. That's the first commandment. Know me. Have a relationship with me. I'm the one that did that. I'm the one that, know me. I did it for you because I want a relationship with you. Okay? That's what he's saying. And he got his love. Well, if he's love, he says, there's no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear because fear has punishment. He who fears is not made perfect in love. Okay? We love him because he first loved us. He rescued us when we were in absolute rebellion against God and everything else, you know, and everything he stood for. He loved us anyway, okay? Romans 8.31. What should we say then about these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? Think about that. If God is for us, who can be against us? He wants a relationship with you because he loves you. That's why he created, you believe, God created the universe so he could have a relationship with everybody in this room. Everybody here, think about it. You might be a little bit special if God created the universe so he could have a relationship with you. Okay. But you got an enemy that don't, don't want you to believe that. You got some lies going on in your head that doesn't want you to believe that. Well, I'm not good enough. I'm not this. I'm not that. It's not about you. It's about him. He created the universe so we could have relationship. And he wants that. Because he loves you, there's really nothing you can do about it. You can either accept it, you can reject it, but you can't change it. Because that's truth. Amen? Shabbat shalom. I would invite anybody who's struggling with that truth uh, to uh, come and see me. If it's um, touched your heart to realize... How, why God created the universe? To have a relationship with you? Come see me. We'll pray about it. Amen? Father, we thank you that you created the universe so that we could have a relationship. We thank you, Father, that you stepped into the, to the universe, not just as Yeshua. You were there from day one in the garden with Adam. Word tells us that. Walked with him in the cool of the day. And you talked with him in the cool of the day. Father, we want that relationship with you. We don't want to be here in, you know, in the vast corners of space alone. And you didn't create us to be that way. You created us, Father, to recognize beauty. You created us to recognize love. You created us to recognize all these attributes, some of which are very detrimental to survival. Beauty's one. Father, we recognize there's a lot of species gone extinct because of their beauty. Because man just loved that beauty. But the big beauty that we've missed, Father, is who you are. And that this whole thing was created so that we could have a relationship. Father, help us with your spirit, your ruach, to cast off the lies that we've been told and step into the truth that stands before us as observational science. Okay? What we can see in historical science, what we see, the real historical science is your word. Because it's just history. And that's not science. That's just truth. And help us recognize that you created every scientific truth that exists. You created every molecule in the universe when you spoke it in existence. And I shudder to think of the power that that took. And that that power wants a relationship with me. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Yeshua's name. Amen. And amen. Shabbat shalom.